This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. I think you can definitely see from, from the film the, that Rustin was perhaps the most controversial of the, uh, the people that I'll talk about in this, uh, in this class. He's also one of the most interesting, I think, and part of that is that his career extends from the 1930s when he becomes um, active in the communist movement. Uh, he breaks with the communists, joins A. Philip Randolph's March on Washington movement, um, also joins a group, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the, uh, which was a pacifist group. They encourage him to become their race relations secretary in the early 40s. That leads him to become one of the pioneers of the Congress of Racial Equality uh, formed during World War II. Um, it's during this time that he uh, becomes a pioneer in the use of Gandhian nonviolent tactics uh, to things like the sit-ins uh, that um, um, later become quite popular in the 1960s. So already during the early 1940s, he's engaged in a lot of these uh, uh, protest activities. And as, a, as one of the first members of the Congress of Racial Equality, his influence was felt uh, for a long time to come. He also, his relationship with A. Philip Randolph is a longstanding relationship going from the 1940s through the 1960s when he becomes the principal organizer of a little event called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And in, in that way, I think uh, Rustin cemented his, his uh, reputation as the most effective of the uh, civil rights organizers um, <coughs> of his time. But even then, his role was extremely controversial. And, uh, Part of that was because he came to Montgomery in 1956 to aid Martin Luther King, um, begins to become Martin Luther King's advisor, one of his principal advisors, and uh, this leads uh, people like um, Adam Clayton Powell to attack him um, you know, in a very personal way, actually demand that Martin Luther King fire him. Uh, with the threat that if he didn't fire him, uh, Powell, Adam Clayton Powell, the New York congressman, would not only reveal that um, um, Martin Luther King was receiving advice from a homosexual, but that Rustin and Martin Luther King were engaged in a sexual relationship. Uh, so uh, for a black congressman to make that kind of a threat, you can imagine um, uh, that King understood that this was very serious. King actually severs his relationship with Rustin for a time, but by the time of the 1963 march, they are back in touch uh, with each other, and they continue to have um, a kind of a advisor, advisee relationship uh, through the mid-1960s, but then broke again over the question of the war in Vietnam. Um, by that time, Rustin had decided that the war issue was less important than having good relations with the Johnson administration and broke with King over the question of the war. So you can see that, that Rustin is a, an extremely important individual uh, through this period, but one whose role is even today debated, um, actually just uh, Last week, I was having a discussion with Clarence, uh, Clarence Jones, who's here as our uh, scholar in residence and someone who knew um, Rustin quite well. And even then, the, the discussion about what was Rustin's role was, was it, how do you assess it? Was it, in, in the end, positive? Was it, um, um, what aspects of it would you be critical about? And uh, so people still maintain these discussions. So what I'd like to do is, uh, with the help of Awele, uh, who is not simply the person who 
comes up and reads the documents I wanted to read, but someone I discussed these things with, and she is uh, uh, one of the reasons why I've really wanted to work with her is that uh, I was so impressed with the way in which she, um, as a dramatist, as an actor, as a writer, has taken historical material and, uh, and dramatized it. And I, and I thought that it would, we would learn a lot from each other by this process of trying to, uh, her trying to select pieces that have some dramatic um, importance and, and significance, uh, but also bringing those into, this, into the classroom. So I think with Rustin, what um, Awele has done is chosen some documents from his life that I think reflect his own effort to understand uh, his, his dilemma. And this is one of the things that, uh, that I think recent his historians have brought out is the extent to which Rustin himself understood his outsider role, uh, his uh, great desire to contribute to the black struggle. So, um, Awele, do you want to... Okay, so I found four different documents um, to me that showed an internal struggle that Bayat Rustin was facing, and in part um, struggling with who he was as a man, um, his desire for relationships and intimacy, and how that was perceived by others. Um, in the film we heard the quote that Musty was bothered by it, he saw that it was a threat um, to him being most effective in what he did well. Um, but I think there was also the question of homophobia of that time. Um, and so I wanted to share with you first a reading when he is in jail, uh, Musty pays two visits to him. And during those two visits, the first visit he explains that he was set. He goes to jail so many times you might mention. Oh sure. So let's see here. This is World War, this is during the war. Okay so he goes to jail, this is during World War II, and while he's there there is a sexual encounter with men and when Musty comes to see him, but also while he's in jail he's doing organizing and he's protesting the conditions of the prisoners and um, he also discovers in himself a very violent reaction and response and that was a, a tension for him because it, when he thinks of himself as a peaceful man and, and um, one of nonviolent philosophy. And so he explains that I've been set up by the guards, it's entrapment. And when Musty comes back for the second visit, he continues along that line, but then he opens up and he admits that, well, some of the charges were true. And so this is a piece of that. So the second visit was on October 21st. And this is Musty speaking. You have been guilty of gross misconduct, especially reprehensible in a person making the claims to leadership and in a sense moral superiority which you are, were making. You have deceived everybody, including your own comrades and most devoted friends. You were capable of making the mistake of thinking that you could be the leader of a revolution of the most basic and intricate kind and at the same time that you were weakling in an extreme degree and engaged in practices for which there was no justification, which a person with a tenth of your brains must have known would defeat your objective. You are still far from facing reality in yourself. In the self that has been and still is you, there is nothing to respect. You must ruthlessly cast out everything in which prevents you from facing that. Only so can your true self come to birth through fire, anguish, complete and childlike humility. He ends his letter to Rustin with the 51st Psalm. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Then I will teach transgress transgressors thy ways. Two days after he receives this letter, he meets with the prison uh, psychologist, and he begins to open up and to give his personal history. 
and he talks about being an illegitimate child. He goes on to talk about his first sexual encounter with a male that visited his home as a young teenager. And then he begins to cry, and he opens up, and he talks about the sexual encounter in the prison. Okay. The next document that I wanted to share with you, it comes from an interview that he did in 1987, but he's reflecting black back over the years from the 20s through the early 80s. And the interviewee poses this question. Later in the early 60s, Adam Clayton Powell threatened to expose you and Strom Thurmond, didn't make an accusation against you. Did you experience many other incidents like these? Rustin. Yes. For example, Martin Luther King, with whom I worked very closely, became very distressed when a number of the ministers working for him wanted him to dismiss me from his staff because of my homosexuality. Martin set up a committee to discover what he should do. They said that, despite the fact that I had contributed tremendously to the organization, I drew up the plans for the creation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and did most of the planning and fundraising in the early days. They thought that I should separate myself from Dr. King. Open hand. When was this, the late 1950s? Rustin. This was about 1960, actually. This was the time when Powell threatened to expose my so-called relationship with Dr. King. There, of course, was no homosexual relationship with Dr. King, but Martin was so uneasy about it that I decided I did not want Dr. King to have to dismiss me. I had come to the SCLC to help. If I was going to be a burden, I would leave, and I did. However, Dr. King was not happy about me leaving. He was deeply torn. Although I had left the SCLC, he frequently called me and he asked me to help. While in 1960, he felt real pressure to fire me. In 1963, he agreed that I should organize the March in Washington, of which he was one of the leaders. And then the last excerpt. During those tumultuous times when your private life was threatened to be exposed, how did you deal with that? Whom did you find support from? Rustin. In June of 1963, Senator Strong Thorman stood in the Congress and denounced the March in Washington because I was organizing it. He called me a communist, a sexual pervert, a draft dodger. The next day, A. Philip Randolph called all the black leaders and said, I want to answer Strong Thurman's attack, but I think we ought not to get involved in a big discussion of homosexuality or communism or draft dodging. What I want to do with the approval of all the black leaders is to issue a statement which says, we, the black leaders of the civil rights movement and the leaders of the trade union movement and the leaders of the Jewish, Protestant, and Catholic Church, which are organizing this march, have absolute confidence as the best way to bring about social, I'm sorry, confidence in Byatt Rustin's ability, his integrity, and his commitment to nonviolence as the best way to bring about social change. He will continue to organize the march without full, with our full and undivided support. He said, if any of you are called, I do not want any discussion beyond that. Is he a homosexual? Has he been arrested? We simply say we have complete confidence in him and his integrity. And that's exactly what happened. Someone came to Mr. Randolph once and said, do you know that Byatt Rustin is a homosexual? Do you know he has been arrested in California? I don't know how you could have, I don't know how you could have anyone who is a homosexual working for you. Mr. Randolph said, well, well, if Byard is a homosexual, is that talented, and I know the work he does for me, maybe I should be looking for somebody else homosexual who could be so useful. <coughs> Mr. Randolph was such a completely honest person who wanted everyone else to be honest. Has anyone said to him, Mr. Randolph, do you think I should openly admit that I am homosexual? His attitude, I'm sure, would have been, Although such an admission may cause you problem, you will be happier in the long run because his idea was that you have to be what and who you are. One of the things that I think would be is important about um, Rustin's impact, um, there's a number of, of things, but one of the things I would draw attention to is his importance in bringing Gandhian ideas uh, to the United States. And this has been uh, a topic that has received increasing attention in recent years, uh, in part to counter the impression that uh, 
Martin Luther King was the crucial individual bringing these ideas that, uh, to, into the black struggle. But 20 years before Martin Luther King emerges, other people, including Rustin, are already uh, sensing the importance of the Gandhian movement in India and its um, potential influence and impact on the African-American struggle. If you go back to black newspapers published during the 1930s, uh, there were many, many articles in those newspapers about the movement in India. And, uh, and many writers sensed that this idea of a mass struggle organized around nonviolent ideas, if it could bring um, results against the British Empire, why not use it in the United States? Uh, among the people involved in this was um, Howard Thurman, a minister who later moved to California, actually uh, set up uh, his church in San Francisco. Uh, in the mid-1930s, Howard Thurman goes to India, meets with Gandhi, and comes back and influences a generation of, of religious activists, including James Farmer, who was one of the founders of the Congress of Racial Equality. Benjamin Mays is another person who goes to India during the 1930s, uh, uh, shortly before he becomes president of Morehouse College in Atlanta. And of course, Benjamin Mays, as the longtime president of Morehouse, would give weekly addresses to the students and often bring lessons drawn from the Gandhian struggle uh, to his students who, of course, included during the 1940s Martin Luther King. Uh, so these individuals were able to take these ideas, um, adapt them to the situation here in the United States, and subsequently, I think they began to develop a strategy of action uh, that of course influenced the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. One of the other things that I think um, can be attributed directly to Rustin is the idea, some of you have heard the slogan, speak truth to power. Anyone know the origins of that? How many of you have heard that slogan, speak truth to power? It's kind of, a, it's often been used in in, uh, in protest movements as an imperative for anyone involved in those movements. And Rustin was one of the first African Americans, one of the first Americans to begin using that phrase. And it appears that uh, he developed it in the early 1940s, um, adapting, and this is kind of um, ironic these days, uh, the saying of Muhammad. Um, and it's, it's uh, the quote is, the most excellent jihad is when one speaks a true word in the presence of a tyrannical ruler. Mm -hmm. And that this idea of jihad, which of course differs a lot from the usual interpretation in the American media, <coughs> as someone who speaks a true word in the presence of a tyrannical ruler, was, was essentially adapted and condensed um, by Rustin when the, um, his religious group, the Quakers, were putting together a pamphlet uh, to guide their efforts during World War II. And this phrase, which um, would appeared in this pamphlet, had enormous influence and uh, throughout the pacifist movement and um, by the 1960s had been almost a commonplace in uh, the struggles of that decade. Now, another aspect of, of Rustin that I think needs to be developed is that the journey of, rec of reconciliation <laughs> that takes place in 1947 can be seen as the first freedom ride. It essentially took the idea of the freedom ride that was used in 1961 
1947, they basically do the, the same thing. After a Supreme Court decision that said that uh, segregation and in interstate travel was unconstitutional, this group goes to the South and tests that and finds that it's not, the Supreme Court decision is not being enforced. Um, Rustin serves uh, 22 days on a chain gang um, as the result of his arrest. But this is, uh, again, a very important forerunner of what happens in 1961. I would say that perhaps the most important aspect of Rustin is his ability to see the connections between the African-American struggle and struggles going on elsewhere in the world. Um, as mentioned in the film, he goes to India, and they, even, even before that, he develops a, a movement in the United States on behalf of the Indian independence movement. Um, he consults with um, Kwame Nkrumah, who later becomes the first president of, of Ghana, and with other African leaders. Uh, Bill Sutherland, who is shown in the film, a, a friend of his, goes to Africa and actually um, stays there. Uh, if he's still alive, I, I believe he's still living. Um, he's, last time I saw him, and uh, he's been on this campus a number of times. Uh, he was living in Tanzania, but he's one of the African Americans who goes to Africa during the 1950s and plays a role in the unfolding African independence struggle. And Rustin is part of that international effort. Um, his support for South African resistance started in 1951, and uh, that effort later became the American Committee on Africa. Um, so you can see that all of these efforts that culminate m much later in the, in the century, and in fact for the South African movement in the 1990s, Rustin has a role in starting them. But all of this really came, um, all of his success really uh, ended to a degree with the morals charge in 1953 when he was arrested in Pasadena. Uh, most of his colleagues in the pacifist movement abandoned him, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, A. Philip, um, A.J. Musty, the person who had been his mentor, um, sent him a, a note basically firing him and saying that, that he had betrayed the trust of the organization. And Rustin himself thought of committing suicide, but um, certainly his career as an activist he thought was over. But he finds work with a, another anti-war group called the War Resisters League. And they offer him a job. And uh, stand behind him and offer him the opportunity to take their ideas throughout the nation. And it's as a member of the War Resisters League that he comes to Montgomery in 1956. Now, Russin's role in Montgomery is this kind of a mini controversy that reflects his entire life. Um, when he arrives, it turns out that uh, he already knows Coretta Scott King because during his travels during the 1940s, he had met her while she was in high school and, had, uh, and she had remembered that, been very influenced, and her own pacifism had kind of grown out of that encounter with, with Rustin. Uh, so that when she, they, she arrives, in part because of Coretta's prior knowledge of him, Martin Luther King accepts him and understands that Rustin has far more knowledge about Gandhi and nonviolence than, than King has at that time. And so King finds himself in, in a dilemma. He wants Rustin's advice. He understands that he has certain expertise as an organizer and as a, as a person who, who is very familiar with Gandhi and, 
<clears throat> thought. But from the very beginning, the other ministers in Montgomery are very suspicious of Rustin once they find out, and it doesn't take them that long to figure out that, that Rustin is gay. Um, and it, there's enough of a record about his um, political background to tar him with the, the communist brush, uh, even though once he breaks with the communists, he actually becomes an anti-communist. But the fact that he had once been a member of the communist movement is enough in 1956 to make him an extremely controversial figure and to open up the Montgomery Improvement Association to the charge of outside communist influence. And from that point on, the relationship between King and Rustin continues to be a very complex one with King wanting to use Rustin for his advice, uh, for his effectiveness. Uh, King would not have created um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and uh, King would not have had an organization to run except for Rustin. Rustin was the person who actually organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and provided King with an organizational vehicle that allowed him to expand his influence beyond uh, Montgomery. But as you can see from the from the uh, uh, my previous remarks, that ended in 1960 when Adam Clayton Powell, suspicious and off, and also jealous of Rustin's influence over King, decides that he needs to destroy this relationship <coughs> and does it in a very um, brutal way of, of, of threatening to expose um, expose them both. Um, now later on, after the March on Washington, I'll just say a, a few words uh, about um, Rustin's influence grew enormously. And it was in part because Randolph pushed the other black leaders to say, we're not going to be divided. We're not going to allow racists like Strom Thurmond to divide the movement over the question of Rustin's homosexuality. And once Rustin stood up for him, the other leaders kind of fell into line, even though some of them grumbled. And after that, Rustin's influence as a political figure grew significantly because for the first time, he did not have to operate in the shadows anymore. And my own feeling about his later life and, and uh, his stands about the Vietnam War is that a lot of his um, decision to stand with the Johnson administration and to oppose King's uh, anti-war views was that once he got that sense of acceptance by the civil rights ex uh, establishment, he did not want to lose it. Once he felt that he was no longer the outsider marginalized because of his sexuality, once he was now part of the liberal democratic Johnson wing of the Democratic Party, once he had this tie to, to Randolph that allowed him to have an income, you know, one of the things that's uh, striking in the film, if, as, if you watch the rest of it, is that during the early 1950s when he's kind of this radical pacifist, his clothes are kind of raggedy. I mean, they're, they're not, they're definitely not, uh, uh, you can kind of tell that he's wearing the same suit that he's been wearing for the last three weeks. Um, by the late 1960s, he's, his threads are pretty nice. I mean, he's, he's well-dressed and he has this bow tie and he's, uh, he's obviously moved up in the world. And my, my sense, and this is um, in terms of trying to understand why he becomes much more cautious and why a person who had spent his life, gone to prison during World War II as a pacifist, ends up supporting Johnson's policy in, in Vietnam, that a large part of it has to do with once he had gotten in, once he was no longer the outsider, 
he didn't want to be the outsider again. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I noticed that the, it was, when it was created, it was the Southern Negro Leader, Leadership Conference, and then it changes later on to Christian. Does that also have anything to do with um, residents of homosexuality and uh, when he leaves the organization? Um, no, I, I think that the original thought was to bring together an organization that would um, kind of provide a, a forum for the leaders of these local struggles that were going on throughout the South. And most of these leaders were black ministers. So I think that um, the use of the term Christian was a way of countering not so much the homosexuality charge, but the communist charge. That part of what, uh, and I'll get into this in, on Thursday's lecture when I get into uh, Coretta and Martin King, is that I think that what they and King in particular brought as a strength is that when you, when you keep in mind what had happened to Du Bois and Robeson, they had been marginalized because they had been too far on the left. And any leader that came to the fore after that, particularly in a leader of protest activity, would in the South be charged with being communist. And I think what King understood is that the best way of responding to that, it didn't necessarily work all the time because he still got charged with being a communist, but the best way of responding was to say we're a Christian movement. So in all of his speeches, he emphasizes that his radicalism doesn't come from Karl Marx. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And the extent to which he's effective in doing this this doesn't necessarily satisfy the segregationists in the South who still, or J. Edgar Hoover, who continued to charge that he's a communist and that the movement is communist inspired, but it does help particularly in getting support outside the South. Um, that, um, that he's not tied up in the 30s and 40s debate about communists and non-communists, or anti-communists. Any other comments? How many of you had heard of Rustin before? Not too much? I mean, what have you heard about him? <coughs> Just, the movie yeah, actually, I was going to show a little scene from, from that. Uh, he's he, uh, the, the film Boycott on HBO has a fictionalized picture of, of um, King's life, but nonetheless has a pretty realistic picture of the first meeting between the two. Did you have a? Yes. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, so like in the 30s, he was, Reston was in the United States a lot, and then we mentioned, or the movie mentioned, that he was um, abroad for a while. So I was wondering if like his, his visits abroad help change his views on like whether war is necessary? Um, I think he had really developed that before that. A lot of it comes from he, his uh, <laughs> grandmother who raised him was a Quaker. And you know the Quakers have this long pacifist tradition. Uh, during the 1930s, he becomes involved in kind of anti-war activities uh, that um, you know, I, I, I think his exposure to Gandhian ideas long before he actually goes to India, you know, so that by the time he, actually, he, gets, he begins to travel extensively, which is more um, the late 40s and early 50s, when he's involved in the anti-nuclear movement, uh, he actually goes to uh, Africa at a time when France is using uh, the Sahara to explode uh, atomic weapons and uh, takes part in a march into the Sahara, Sahara to prevent that from happening. Uh, the, all of those kinds of things. By that time, his, his views are pretty well, pretty well developed. Um, just on a personal level, one of the um, uh, people I wanted to interview for the SNCC book, uh, 
I went around to the country uh, just trying to interview as many people as I could. I tried to get an interview with, with Rustin. And uh, at that time, he was living in uh, Philadelphia. And I went to his office. And um, by, the, by that time, he had already become a leader of the A. Philip Randolph Institute. And uh, so I walk into this office, and I kind of saw a you know, bureaucracy there. I mean, it was like there were secretaries and reception people. and. And I couldn't get past them. I never even got to see him, you know, much less interview him. And it, it just seemed very uh, striking that if I had you know, gone to try to interview him 20 years earlier, I probably would have been, been able to walk right up to him. And, and, uh, but by that time, he was kind of insulated himself and had become a, a leader of this organization. And uh, so I missed out on the interview. but I. But I found out something just from, from the attempt to do it. Yes? Why, why didn't you say it any time? I tried. Um, I, <laughs> uh, when, when appointments fail, this is something about doing research. When appointments fail, you, you, you go and knock on the door. And uh, a, lot of times, a lot of times, you just don't get any answer. I didn't get a no answer. I just didn't get any answer. Did somebody so. physically stop you? Or? No, they, I just said, a, you know, I'd like to interview him. And then they said, well, you know, he's got a busy schedule. And uh, said, well, I'm only going to be here for a day or two. And, uh, uh, you know, just, there was just no way of getting. It was quite clear that there was, they were the gatekeepers. And <laughs> I, I got kept out. <laughs> so they were doing their job. Yeah. And uh, it, it also kind of reminds me when, when People come here to try to get uh, get access to try to make myself accessible. You know, one of the there, I've learned a lot of lessons in do, in doing the research. Um, uh, one of one of the other ones I remember is uh, there was a a scholar who wrote a book about SNCC before mine, and and I wanted to um, talk with him because I wanted to find out what he what kind of materials he had. But I also understood that, you know, here I was writing a book that would compete with his. And it was Howard Zinn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, uh, who now I guess has become famous because of his people's history of the United States. But uh, so I, I um, went to Howard Zinn's office and, and uh, he said, uh, yeah, I have materials that are over at the house. Uh, come on over and uh, invited me over. Um, said here, you know, went up to the attic. There were all these boxes of, of, of material, and he said, "There's a photocopy shop down the street. Um, you know, find out what you need. Take it over there, and uh, photocopy what you need, and you know, stay as long as you want." And uh, that, to me, it was the model for me. To, you know, and just recently, in the last couple of years, a, a young person was doing uh, a book on SNCC. And I was kind of in the opposite. She came out here to do the research. And, and I remembered that. And, and it was um, so tried to do exactly the same thing of just making all the materials available and just saying, being as helpful as possible. And if she writes a better book, then so be it. <laughs> and uh, the book just came out, by the way. So maybe I'll be assigning it instead of mine after, after a while. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I was wondering how you felt about the Korean War. The which? The Korean War. What he felt about it? Yeah, because it's kind of in the middle, so I'm wondering. Um, he, was, he was very much opposed to the Korean War. And in fact, until the Vietnam War, it would have never been a question. I mean, he's a pacifist. So he's opposed to all war. And. Um, and I think that that was why people were surprised and felt that he had kind of sold out on, on, the, on the Vietnam War. Uh, but um, yeah, and, and to, to some degree, maybe, maybe it, it was. But many liberals um, felt ambivalent. King himself was reluctant, and I'll get into this later, uh, to criticize the Vietnam War. He was one of the last people to. Uh, 
to kind of join in with the anti-war forces because he felt that Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, had done some great things. He had passed two major pieces of civil rights legislation. He had launched the War on Poverty. Um, he had done all this, this wonderful stuff. So how could you, how could you come out and oppose him on the question of the war? So um, it was a difficult decision for, for many of the, of the um, people who had kind of backed Johnson on his domestic policies uh, to find that uh, they weren't. And when Johnson, when King finally did take a stand, it really meant a rupture of his relationship with, with Johnson. Part of the reason why Rustin is saying don't oppose the war is there might be some, some problems with the war, but our m biggest priority is domestic, that we need to support Johnson because Johnson's policies are helping deal with the problems of economic and, and other kinds of problems faced by black people. Okay. So I wanted to show you um, actually the, the part of the, the film that deals with the first meeting between Rustin. One of the things that uh, I, I just wanted to say in concluding that when we look at the, the people, the individuals who I will profile in this class, all of them in various ways are trying to expand the discussion of race and to include other factors. For example, when we look at King and Robeson, their, their own insights are leading them to understand that class is a major factor, that you have to deal with the economic issues, that you have to deal with the relationship of the black working class and the white working class. And this is kind of pushed on them by um, the, the emergent influence of the Communist Party. Um, but uh, for both of them, they're kind of blind on other issues, uh, particularly issues of gender. Uh, King, um, du Bois tries to uh, deal with that. He actually writes essays on the position of women, and he takes great positions. But as I, I mentioned in my lecture, there was a certain blindness uh, about his understanding of gender issues. And with respect to sexuality, uh, during precisely the time when uh, Rustin is coming of age, King is firing his longtime assistant at the crisis when a, an incident happens to him. He's arrested uh, for homosexual behavior, uh, which was criminalized throughout the United States. And Du Bois responds by asking for his resignation because he understands that this is something that um, you know, he doesn't want to deal with as a, as a leader of a reform group trying to get the public on his side. Um, now, he later regrets that. And he later admits in his own writings that that was one of the hardest things for him to do. And he felt bad for the rest of his life about having done it. But he did it. Um, similarly, as I mentioned with King, you know, he, he does break off his official ties. He doesn't um, allow Rustin to continue as a, his official advisor. So when we get to, to Rustin, one of the things that it, it does is it brings to the fore the issue of sexuality and the ways in which he's almost a person who serves as a test for the other leaders in terms of their ability and willingness to confront issues of sexuality. So one of the themes that, that I'll try to develop through this course is the way in which our concept of what it means to be black, what it means in terms of black-white relations in the United States, and how does that, um, how is that affected by other kinds of identity? And what you'll see is that there's a general trend 
from the 30s to the 90s in which the concepts of racial identity become increasingly complex, in, increasingly interrelated with other kinds of identities. And um, we'll understand this more when we see how concepts of black militancy that were common in the black power era, the black arts movement, the ways in which those concepts of identity were kind of rooted in black male, black heterosexual male um, identity. And that was assumed to be the identity of all the race. And then, we, of course, we have a generation of black feminist writers, people like Alice Walker, um, who would be a prime example, who come along to remind us that black identity is much broader than that, much more complex than that. And of course, by the 1990s, we understand uh, that um, identity is itself questioned, and, and we begin to talk about the essentialization of, of black identity and the need to understand how it's socially constructed and how it has been socially reconstructed um, over time. So I, I hope that one of the themes that you will notice and begin to think about is how these various leaders have either added to our understanding or have been silent on issues uh, that are now at the, at, you know, at the heart of our discussion of racial identity. See you on Thursday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.